you want to point some things out that the Lord was impressing upon my heart and my mind today. You know, John is writing and addressing three categories of believers. Little children, ones who are still babes in Christ, and uh, 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 1, and then verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. He says in verse 13, For I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him, that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. And, you know, <clears throat> you, you got to understand that he's talking about uh, those who've just been born, still babes in Christ and growing in, in the Lord. And then Father's talking about those who are of full age and and going on unto perfection. He's talking about the young men, those who have been uh, weaned from the milk of the, and are mature and are spiritual and are coming unto full age. And, you know, also, um, and, and in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, he, he he makes this statement, and now little children abide in him, as he, as Jesus said it. And you you got to understand that to abide in him means to walk in obedience to him. And and I'm telling you now, knowing from my personal experience when I was born again in 1987 of June that the Spirit of God is able to make you walk in obedience. I had no knowledge of Scripture. You don't, you don't, you know, we're to grow in knowledge so that we may grow in the full discernment of the truth. But you can... <laughs> You can be led of the Spirit and and have absolutely no knowledge of Scripture. I mean, we need to understand that. I think that's an important truth for people to, to see. And, you know, it is, you know, the thing is, it's not. People are placing this condemnation on believers. And we cannot please God in condemnation. To the to the pure, all things are pure, he says in Titus 1.15. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and their conscience are defiled. And that's the heretic, someone who's self-willed, you know. And, and he says... You know, a heretic, someone who self-willed after the first and second gentle warning knows such a one to turn away because he continues to sin being self-condemned. I mean, we need, and this goes back to uh, what I've been teaching on being made perfect, talking about the conscience. You know, it's, uh, it's like he says here in, in verse 28, and now little children abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And this is talking about, it was just like Aaron who made the people naked by uh, taking the gold from them and casting it into the fire and this molten calf coming out and they offered burnt sacrifices and stuff to it and rose up to play and when Moses came down 
from the mount with Joshua and and uh, uh, and the Moses saw it. He took the tablets that God had took, written with his finger upon the tablets on both sides, the commandments that he should give unto the children of Israel. And uh, as I said in, in uh, part six of being made perfect, he says, what do these people do unto you that you should, you know, cause them to uh, sin such a great sin? And you have to see that, you know, like covetousness is, is idolatry, you know. Uh, it says that Moses took the molten calf and he threw it in, he, he burned it with the fire and strawed it and threw it upon the waters and made the people drink from it. And, you know, um, it says that Aaron made the people naked. He exposed the shame of their nakedness before their enemies. And we have to say that covetousness, that's just the opposite of contentment. You know, it is idolatry, as he says in Colossians, you know. Uh, and you know, we gotta we we need to, because and not be ashamed before him at his coming. He said, Abide in him that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Abide in him. And that means walking in obedience to him. As the writer of Hebrews uh, spoke of Jesus as our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, he said in Hebrews 5, 9, he says, And having been made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation or initiator of eternal salvation to as many as obey him and to abide in him is to walk in obedience to him that's what paul was talking about in second corinthians thirteen five. examine yourself whether you be in the faith prove or test your own self do you not know yourself your own self how Christ be in, is in you, except you be reprobates. And as he says in Romans eight thirteen, if we live after the flesh, we will die. But if we through the Holy Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, we shall live. And this has to do with the shame of our nakedness. We need to see that. And I, as I was trying to point out the conscience and the shame of our nakedness and how it was exposed by the knowledge of good and evil, by the disobedience, by the first man, Adam, you know, the, the, the spirit of bondage entered in with the shame of our nakedness and, you know, man not wanting to entertain the, the thought of God, you know, uh, and hide himself from God to not want to entertain the thought of God and this is what Paul is talking about in, in Romans uh, what was it chapter 1 or 2 I think it's chapter 2 you know you know who when they knew God did not glorify him as God but kept, became vain in their imaginations you know and they worship and serve the creation rather than the creator and uh, they they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they they he says they held the truth of God in their lie meaning to, and the Greek word means to suppress or hold down and that's what Paul was getting at and Second Corinthians ten five when he says, you know, casting down or four and five where he says weapons are a warfare are mighty through God to the 
pulling down or destroying or demolishing strongholds and imaginations and everything, lifting itself, every lofty thing lifting itself up against the knowledge of God, bringing it in every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ who lives in us. And then he says in verse 6, having a readiness to punish every disobedience once your obedience is complete, full. And that's talking about coming to the knowledge of the truth, talking about coming into full age. And and that's really what John is getting at in chapter 3. He says, because he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God or the children of God, the sons of God. Therefore, the world doesn't know us because it didn't know him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And and to give some content to that, and I believe John is, is writing that revelation because of what he saw when he saw the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ when he wrote Revelations. Because I forget which chapter it's in, but uh, he when, when a certain man appeared to him, or in the form of a man, he began he he began to fall down in worship, and he said, "See to it that you do it not, for I am of thy brethren, and hold the testimony of Jesus Christ." And so we need to we need to get the hold of the revelation of that, you know, because he looked so much like Jesus that he almost started to fall down in worship. But he said, see to it that you do it not, for I am of thy brethren. And so this is what he is talking about. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, because that's when we are going to change. As Paul said, in the moment of, in the twinkling of an eye, you know, it's going to happen that fast. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, faster than I can snap my finger. <laughs> twinkling of an eye, faster than a snap. I mean, <laughs> he says, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever, whoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. And uh, he says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Now, see, he's talking about to, he's talking to the little children, not the not the ones who are full grown, because they already know this truth. He's he's talking to them, and he said. In uh, chapter 2 of First John, verse 26, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. And he says, I have not, in verse 21, he says, I have not written unto you because you don't know the truth, but because you know it and know lies of the truth. And uh, chapter 3, he says, He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. And this comes back to the conscience, and whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I mean... We need to understand that, you know? I mean, John is saying the same thing and teaching the same thing that Paul and Peter and the writer of Hebrews are and James. Is, you know, we got to understand that. Uh, 
And when he says, I, I write these things unto you, not because you don't know the truth, but because you do know the truth. And we got to understand it on that level that the writer of Hebrews in 1026, you know, talking about the knowledge of the truth, the full discernment of the truth, uh, that if we willfully sin once we've received or come to the knowledge of the true truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. So John, what John is talking about is a willful sin, a knowing, a conscious awareness of sin. And, you know, so, I mean, we need to, we need to see the revelation of that. He's taught because the word commit, he who commits sin is talking about coming into an agreement with it and fulfilling it. So there's a difference. And and we and we got to see that is it about our conscience and walking by faith, which faith comes by hearing, but the hearing, our hearing for faith comes by the word of God. I mean, and, and it's, it's, it goes back to what Paul said in, in uh, Romans 14, 22, blessed is the man who is not condemned in that thing which he allows. And, and it's all about growth because, you know, you do something and your conscience is smitten and you're condemned. And see, this goes back to Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. As just as he said in Galatians uh, 5, 16, 17, and 18, when he said, I say then walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the evil desires of the flesh or the desires of the flesh. He says for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and the two are contrary. So we can't do what we will. And, and I'm telling you that's possible. You don't have to have knowledge of scripture to submit yourself unto the spirit of God that dwells in you. All you have to do is be walking in the faith that you were baptized into. You believe God raised him from the dead. And when you were baptized, you were being baptized into his death and risen with him to the right hand of God. And you were willing to confess him Lord, meaning to make him Lord. You're willing to surrender your life so that Christ may live in you. And that's why Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness to punish every disobedience when your obedience is full or complete. You know, because it is just a matter of it is by his spirit. I believe it's Zechariah 4, 6, you know, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. You know, and, and as Paul points out in Romans 9, when he's talking about Pharaoh, you know, he's, his conclusion at the end of all that was, so then it is not a matter of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but God who shows mercy. As he told as he told Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and whom I will I harden. And and that's what Paul wrote that as. And and Paul, if you read if you read Acts, Paul was raised up and he knew both Greek and Hebrew. That's why in in chapter twenty two of Acts when he saw Pharisees and he began to speak uh, in Hebrew, whoever wrote said that when they saw him, when they heard that he was speaking Hebrew, they gave the more earnest attention to the things that he was saying because he was speaking Hebrew. When he asked uh 
the chief captain of the Romans who pulled him out from the midst of the Jews when he was being beat and the centurions were brought him, bringing him up he said am I permitted to speak and he was speaking Greek he says who, who said you could speak Greek He's, and he gave him, he gave Paul space to speak I mean I mean you read the testimony from the time I think it starts around chapter uh, 19 or something when he had, when he came back from Ephesus and he had greeted the brethren in, in Jerusalem and they were they were warning Paul that there were a lot of devout Jews that had believed and that had heard that he was teaching the Gentiles contrary to the to the customs of Moses and teaching contrary and teaching them not to circumcise their children and uh, he said there were four men that had put themselves under a vow he says go with them therefore and and uh consecrate yourself sanctify yourself according to the law and show them you know that those things aren't true and and Paul did so and when they found him in the temple when they heard when he had he had he had went through the the time and had sanctified himself and purified himself and when they found him in the temple they that's what they found is Paul sanctified and purified according to the law and worshiping God and when they heard that he was there it says that they had stirred up certain people against him and uh, they drug him out of the temple they went in and drug him out of the temple because they had supposed that uh, he had brought Titus in there and defiled the temple, who was who was a Greek, because he was uncircumcised, and and so you got to see. I mean, the importance of the conscience, the importance of the conscience. You know, while we are not justified by the outward forms of the law, you know, by the Holy Spirit, we fulfill the righteous requirements of the law, as he, as he said in Romans 8, 4, that the righteous requirements of the law, because of what Jesus has done, that the righteous requirements of the law may be uh fulfilled or carried out by those who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit and that has to do with those who are uh, cuz you, you you there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus if you're not walking after the flesh but after the spirit I mean, and people, you know, translators have cut off the last half of that verse. In Romans, Roman or uh, Galatians chapter five is telling us the same thing. I say them walk in the spirit, and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. The two are contrary, so that you cannot do what you will. But if you be led of the spirit, he says in verse eighteen of chapter five of Galatians, you're not under a law. You're not under any law that has to do with keeping a clear conscience. As James says, the one who knows the good to do it and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. As Paul said, what's where is not a faith is sin. And I don't, you know, repeatedly, the Lord has emphasized Romans 14, 23, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. And we're talking about fear and we're talking about the conscience, the shame of our nakedness. And we need to understand that.
We need to understand this because that's what Paul was emphasizing in Romans 8. You know, we've not get, been given a spirit of bondage again to fear, but a spirit of adoption. And so we need to, we need to understand that, but still, even in uh, uh, second, what Second Corinthians seven, I think it is, where he's, I, I've mentioned in my other videos that he's saying perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I mean, even as the Old Testament scripture, the Proverbs teaches that you know, fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know, so the Paul or John is John is talking about willful sin, not practicing sin. He's talking about someone he's talking about committing sin and the Greek word just mean doesn't have anything to do with practice. I mean you look up the Greek word now. You know, people have made it to mean that because it is a hard saying because it's like Peter said of the writing, the people that twist the writings of Paul, you know, those of the unlearned twist his writings as they do the rest of the scripture to their own hurt. It is, it is, it is a matter of willful sin, consciously sinning knowing the good to do and sinning anyway. And it's, I mean, this has to do with the heretic who's defiled his conscience because he was living outside of his faith. And you know, people, people are good at throwing around condemnation. And you know, Paul said, you who are spiritual, that means people that have come into maturity in Christ, you know, and I've seen people that haven't been believers very long and they just, they, they thought it was their place to go around and, and force, force peace. You know, you got, and, and I've had, I've had brothers just come and pick arguments with me and I'm like, Look, dude, I'm not going to enter into this dispute with you. This is not right. And, and, uh, he's all in the flesh. And then later I got these two guys coming along, uh, throwing this condemnation on me, trying to force me to apologize to the, to the one who came and picked the fight. And I'm like, I'm not even the one that entered it. And and right after that, I was like, you know, okay. And but that's wrong. You don't apologize for when you haven't done the wrong. Jesus said, take heed to yourself. Matthew and Mark both write of Jesus' words. If your sin, if your brother sin against you, go and rebuke him. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he hears you not, you know, then take another one or two brothers and go that every word shall be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. But you got these two that were running around and forcing the innocent party to apologize to the guilty party. I mean, it's... You know, that's just Satan. That's just Satan bringing condemnation upon the innocent. And, you know, and there's other, there's other things, but, you know, <laughs> we need to arm ourselves. I mean, because in the innocent should not be apologizing to the guilty. It should be the ones who are guilty of the trespass that should be humbling themselves. And that brother had a problem with humbling himself, I'm telling you. I was like, he was like, even after, even after me apologizing to him when I hadn't even done any, any wrong, 
because he was the one that came and picked the fight with me. And then he came to me again after I had apologized. I was like, don't come to me again doing this. I said, because this is wrong. I'm not going to argue with you. And he sat there and told me he was going to do it again. Uh, and I mean, this is Satan getting in people's heads and, and puffing them up and, and using, and, 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 you know, those two weren't, but I didn't believe, I, I, you know, you're never going to convince me that, that two men like that are, are born of God and, and doing stuff like that, making the innocent apologize to the guilty. I don't think so. You know, it is about truth. The love of God rejoices in the truth. And that means that the one who's guilty of the trespass should humble himself and go and apologize. You know, it's nothing about being um, big enough to apologize to the one that done you wrong. That is just stupidity. That's Satan. That's Satan. That is, that is not justice. That is not justice. You know, it is time for justice. It, what did, you know, Micah 6, 8, you know, he has shown you, oh man, what is that good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? You know, you know, being merciful is like, uh, Joseph, I mean, read read the testimony of Joseph when when he saw because he was a spouse to Mary, you know, just meaning he he was engaged to her, and when he saw that she was with child, you know, Scripture says that he was going to put her away privately and not make a public example of her. But that was when the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the dream and and say and said unto him, you know, fear not to take unto you, Mary, your wife. He says, for that the child that is within her is holy. And, you know, Joseph received that by faith. You know, and, and Mary, what the angel that came to her and spoke unto her the words that he did, he she believed. He, she said, be it unto thy handmaiden according to your word. You know, and, you know, it comes back to that John seven seventeen. If anyone's willing to do the will of God, they will know concerning the doctrine whether it comes from God or man. Jesus said whether it comes from me because they thought the Jews in his day, days, the scribes and the Pharisees, thought that he was working his miracles by the prince of demons, Beelzebub, you know, who, you know, some some scholars think that that was Baal, you know, so. Uh, you know, so we need to, The truth is what should prevail and keeping our conscience clear. And, and I just feel like that, you know, what John has written in his first letter, you know, really needs to be explained. Because when he says, he that commits sin is of the devil, and you got to understand that comment is talking about to come in agreement with and fulfill it. That's, that's what the Greek word means. And you look at the writer of Hebrews in 1026, if we willfully sin, willfully sin, after we have come, and that means to consciously, knowingly, sin. That means, like James said, 417, 
knowing the good and not doing it, or as Paul said, you know, doing something that, that we don't have the faith for that's outside of the faith and and doing it anyway, because whatsoever is not a faith of sin, not walking in fear, walking by the spirit. If you if you're if you're led of the spirit, you're under no law. Galatians five eighteen. But that doesn't and you know, people people were being taught to ignore their conscience. And you know, as 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 we're growing up in Christ, is like he was teaching in uh, Ephesians, you know, proving and testing what is good. You know, and as he said in Romans 12, 1, the only way that we're going to know what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is because we offer our bodies as living sacrifices by the mercies of God, you know, as, as our spiritual worship to him. That means we're surrendering the will of our flesh and our soul to Christ. That's what he's talking about in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Bringing every thought captive, every, you know, every lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God that we have. You know, because that knowledge is that partial fragmentary experimental knowledge that we have as babes in Christ. And it takes that to come to the full, the, the knowledge of the truth, the full discernment of the truth is what the Greek word means is full discernment, to fully discern the truth, who Jesus is the truth, John fourteen six. So, you know, it's not talking about practicing sin. It is t because if you're sinning, it isn't sin unless you know it's sin. And if you're sinning, and it's because you don't, and, and you're saying, that it was outside of your power, then that's a heretic. Someone self-willed, continuing to sin because they're self-condemned. And that's because of a person that has had their conscience defiled. As the, you know, that's what Paul was talking about, you know, to destroy your brother for me. You know, we ought to walk charitably. Don't cast stumbling blocks in front of another, one another. And you got all, everyone, and here goes, here goes the, here goes the snare of Satan. Whenever you're talking about this, and they'll say, do you have any sin in your life? And, you know, if you start boasting, that's why it's a snare of Satan. Because you can't boast because there is no boasting, but a dead man can't sin. That's what he's getting at in Romans 6, 7. He who's dead is freed from sin, justified from sin, made righteous from sin, freed from the law, but that as long as we are led of the spirit we're under no law because we're walking by the faith that i'm dead to the law because i'm risen to the right hand of god the flesh is dead therefore if christ lives in us romans 8 10 but our spirit is alive as paul said in one place i you know uh I think it was in Acts whenever he was before he was given testimony before the Roman uh, court that, you know, the God whom I serve with my spirit, you know. And we got to understand in Colossians 3 3 that we are dead and our life is hid with Christ in God, the Holy Spirit. We are sealed 
with the Holy Spirit of promise. As he says in another place, where we have been given the earnest, the down payment of the purchased possession. Our bodies were purchased by the, the sacrifice of Jesus. I don't, you know, and if people will understand that, that Adam was planted as a natural man in the garden, you know, created subject to vanity, as he says in Romans chapter 8, by reason of him who had the same in hope, talking about bringing many sons unto glory. He planted man, as he, as he points out in 1 Corinthians 15, howbeit that which was spiritual was not first, but that which was natural, and then that which was spiritual. Because God has to have the preeminence in everything. No one shall boast. And, and see, that is what gets everything twisted. But we got to stop throwing around condemnation and calling people sinners. You know, Paul never referred to a believer as a sinner. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you know, he said, uh, the, to the rest I speak, not the Lord. He said, if, if a believer be married to an unbeliever and they be pleased to dwell with them, let them not depart. And he says, or how do you know if the, if the believer shall not save the unbelieving? Because the, the unbeliever is sanctified by the believer. He says, else were your children unholy, but now are they holy. And as he told Peter in, in Acts 10, when, when he showed him the unclean beast, you know, he said, rise, kill, eat. He says, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. And the God said, what I have cleansed, do not call common or unholy or common or unclean, same thing. You know? You gotta stop holding God's people in condemnation and let them rise. We cannot please God with a defiled conscience. And we will not enter in without faith. And you cannot have faith with a defiled conscience. And I don't care what kind of lies people are out. And I know there's plenty of lies. If you are abiding in him, the body is dead because of sin. John says it. Paul says it. You know, if Christ dwell in you, the body is dead because of sin, Romans 8, 10, but our spirit is alive because of righteousness. You know, it is not because of anything that we do. When we were born again, as Peter said, we were born again, not of a corruptible seed, but the incorruptible word of God. We were given a new nature. Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, 17, and 18. Henceforth, no, we know one after the flesh. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 5. For this reason, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And in verse 18, he says, and all things are of God. All things are of God. Who has reconciled us, not reconciling, who has reconciled us back to himself in Christ. And he says the same thing in Colossians 1, 21 through 23. He says, we who were once alienated from God by wicked works in our mind, has he reconciled? Not reconciling has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death.
But you got to be born again. You got to be born again. And you can't know the power of his resurrection that gives you new life unless you're born again of water and the Spirit. Because it is in water baptism in Jesus' name, into Jesus Christ, not a trinity. God is not a trinity. I mean, people need to get that into their head. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And, and, and I've, been, I've, been, I've been mistakenly saying that Adonai Jehovah is one, one Adonai, but it, it actually should be Jehovah, your, your God, is one Jehovah. Uh, he's one God he's one and, and Paul Paul points that out in Ephesians 4 one Lord, one faith, one baptism one spirit, one body, one God is one there's no trinity and, and Satan it, you know he's taken Matthew's you know, go therefore baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And there's only one name in the name of the Father. Jesus said, I'm coming in my Father's name, John 5, 43. Another shall come in his own name. He's the one you're going to receive. How is it that you receive honor which comes from one another and not the honor which comes from God? And the Holy Spirit is sent in the name of Jesus, John 14, 26. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not names anyway. And, you know, Jesus, you know, people have twisted the revelation of Jesus because they don't truly believe that God came in the flesh because they still think that Jesus is God where he was made a man. Paul plainly in chapter 2 of Philippians he emptied himself to be made a man. He was saying in the Gospel of John you know, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And I, even the writer of Hebrews says that, you know, what, because Paul says that God is rec reconciling all things back unto himself in Christ. And we've got to see that once once all things are accomplished, that the Son will give all rule back unto God, the Father, and he'll be he himself will be subject to him. And I have to, I'll have to go look that up, but this video is getting long. And I'm going to end this and uh, let that statement be an encouragement for people to put er, prove everything, put everything to the test and go search the scripture out like the people of Berea, you know, search the scripture daily to see if those things are so. You know, that's if, if people if people were doing that for everything that people are speaking behind that pulpit, you know, none of the lies that are present today would even be, you know, and there probably wouldn't be as many church buildings. But people, people think that they're supposed to just believe everything that they hear. 
instead of put everything to the test and and people are just lazy people are just lazy your life depends on it your life depends on it and you, you do well to go and prove all things everything and you know what? The person who is hungering and thirsting after righteousness, that is exactly what they're going to get. But if you want to believe a lie, you're going to believe a lie. Even as Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, God shall send them a working delusion for their believing a lie. You know? Is because that they had pleasure in unrighteousness rather than receiving the love of the truth that Jesus came and redeemed us. I mean, it's no big thing that God planted the first man, everyone was sold under sin in the fullness of times. He came and was made flesh. As the second man, the last Adam, lived a sinless life, but was subject to all the weaknesses that we are, but yet without sin. So that we, if we abide in him, can walk in that same obedience. And, and it's not a matter of being perfect. It's a matter of walking by the faith. And just doing what we know is good. You know, and not what we want to make out to be good. I mean, good Lord, people have exchanged what's good. People are twisted in their head. I mean, and that just goes to... All about self, all about self. Keeping a clear conscience before God because people, people have violated their conscience so much that they're just, they're past feeling. They're past feeling. They're going to, I mean, they're going to have to go through some, they're going to have to go through something to be cleansed and purged and purified. And even as a believer, those, we learn obedience by the things we suffer, you know, and the modern faith movement just steers people away from that. And, uh, Amen. Amen.